And uh, from there, she rose through the ranks, or she became um, assistant chief there of the Northern California section. And so now she's the chief of the Bureau of Cannabis Control in California, and we have her here today, and uh, she's here to give a few comments uh, for our community here. So uh, if you would all help me welcome uh, Lori Ajax. Thank you, Chief. Um, I really appreciate it. Thank you for having you be here tonight. I have never been to Port Wainimi, and I had to learn how to say that right, too. Um, it's tough doing a Google search when you don't even know how to spell it, but what a, what a pleasure it is to be here tonight. Um, yes, I've been in my position three years, and I wish I could tell you that it gets easier. It doesn't, and I'm sure the chief can say that too, along with all of the retailers here. But I'll tell you what, going out to the retail locations today was really just a pleasure. Um, really, uh, for me, it was nice to see regulation of cannabis working here in the city. And um, really, just great perfect places. I think I learned something at each one. And so I think you have a lot to be proud of in this city. Um, and it makes us feel good, because in a lot of places, it isn't as easy. Um, you know, there's still a lot of local jurisdictions that do not allow uh, cannabis regulation, but I think um, this city has really shown that if it's done right, it really works well. Um, so, you know, I like coming to, you know, I want to get, you know, we try to get to do outreach all over the state, and so I think it's always good to address the community and let them know what we're doing at the state, because I think it's really important. I mean, uh, cannabis regulation is new. Uh, so I'm gonna first tell you, probably, for some of you, you're wondering, well, who is this person up here? And what is she doing? Uh, so the Bureau of Cannabis Control uh, started out as a new agency three years ago. Uh, and that's very unusual in state government. They're usually, uh, you don't have new agencies, but we were chosen and uh, uh, to be the first uh, uh, bureau to set up the state regulatory system for both medicinal and adult use cannabis. So our role is regulating uh, the retailers, the distributors, we have micro businesses, we have testing labs that we regulate, and also temporary cannabis events. But we've set up our system where we have other uh, agencies at the state that are involved in regulating, and that includes the California Department of Food and Ag, and they regulate all the cultivators, and then we have the Department of Public Health who regulates all the manufacturers. And so we have three agencies doing regulation at the state, and then our job, we have to issue, we issue the state license, so everybody over here that's against that wall, they have a state license, but they also have to have local approval from the local jurisdiction. So unlike you know other uh, areas, like for example, I came from alcohol, the state is the sole licensing authority with cannabis regulation. It is local <coughs> control. The locals have complete control of whether or not they're going to allow cannabis regulation in their city or county. And so the state can't dictate to the city or county and say, we're going to issue a license. We have to have that local approval. We are starting to see more cities and counties get involved. Uh, we're probably just over a third of the cities and counties that do allow cannabis regulation. And every every day that does change, we see new ordinances taking place and more cities and counties getting involved. Uh, for the Bureau, we've been, between the three licensing authorities, uh, we've, been issue, we've already been issuing licenses across the state um, so far. Um, we have over 10,000, almost, uh, I think 10,600 temporary licenses in the state of California, uh, which is pretty much, an, we started issuing licenses last year on January 1st, 2018, when we were statutorily mandated. So by the end of the year, we were almost to 11,000 licenses. Uh, at this point, uh, all those temporary licenses need to be transitioned to either a provisional or an annual license. So. Uh, and a lot of you may hear, a lot of us are trying to make sure we're issuing those annuals or provisionals uh, before uh, people's temporaries expire. So that, we don't want any gap in licensing, so we want to make sure there's a smooth transition. So one of our biggest priorities is just making sure that we keep people that have temporaries in business and get to make sure they get their license. 
um, and, and then make sure that those that don't have temporary licenses that we keep issuing licenses because we got a lot of folks that you know are trying to get through city and county processes, state processes to, to be uh, a legal in the state. Uh, a lot of what we're doing is, uh, as many of you might know, in order to uh, oversee and regulate cannabis licensees, we actually have to put rules in place. Uh, so the state developed the rules. Our final rules went into place uh, in January of this year. Uh, and it, it's a lot for these guys. Uh, you know, when, when, you, when you go into these retail locations that are licensed by both the city and the state, there's a lot of rules for them to follow. Um, it's, it's probably stricter than anything I've ever seen, even in alcohol. There's rules on you know, security and hours of operation and inventory control, you name it. There's a lot of rules for them. So it's our responsibility at the state to make sure, one, that the local jurisdiction knows what we're doing. And so we're not, you know, you know, the last thing we want to do is we have a rule that conflicts with cities and counties. And, and so there, that's a, there's a lot of education there and a lot of education for our licensees. So one of the things we do is we go out and we inspect these, uh, these uh, licensees, whether it be distribution, testing labs, retailers, to make sure they're following all of the rules. A lot of the cities and counties do the same thing. So a lot of education, making sure people understand the rules. We know it's really hard to, you know, we came, when we started this journey, you know, we had a lot of folks out there that were already in business, and they, there was no state regulation, and in some cases there weren't a lot of local regulation. So it is a learning curve for both the state, because we're learning how, it, how these businesses uh, work, um, and also a learning curve for the licensees and understanding the rules of the state. Um, and so for, this is our second year of implementation. Uh, I'm going to tell you there's always a lot of work to do, a lot of changes to do. And so we're continuing trying to educate the public and um, our licensees. Uh, one of the things that we'll be developing probably, in the, and we'll, we'll see some stuff come out in the next couple of weeks, is we, we actually have a public awareness campaign really to educate both the consumer. Because one thing we're finding, is, and I don't know if most of you know, all the cannabis that they sell at a legal retail shop has to go through mandatory testing. They're testing for over 66 pesticide, mold, mildew, contaminants. So when you buy cannabis at these retail locations, you're going to get safe product. But for most of you, I'm going to guess, would you even know when you walked in a license retailer, whether they're licensed or not? It, it's not always easy. You're not always looking for a license or whatnot. So we've developed a public campaign so we can uh, educate the consumer on where to go for a, a retail licensee. So, because I think that's our responsibility to say, hey, these are the places to go to and, and they're licensed in the state. So really communicating that to the public and explaining to them how, why it's important to go to a retail licensee. Because what's the biggest complaint we get from probably consumers is they're gonna say, well, it's more expensive to go to a legal shop than going from the illegal market. So we've got to make sure people understand why it's important to go to the legal market. The other thing that this campaign is going to accomplish is to make sure that we're explaining to folks that are still unlicensed that they need to be licensed. If they're selling cannabis, if they're conducting any kind of commercial activity, it, they need to get a license. Um, there's still a lot of educating to do on that, and that's part of this campaign. But equally as important is for us to go after the unlicensed market. Uh, as a lot of you folks know, uh, it was a, there's a lot of people that are still conducting commercial cannabis activity and they're unlicensed and they're unwilling to get licensed in some cases. And we're finding, you know, the first year we sort of took the approach where we're just going to try to educate and get people into the regulated market. But none of our licensees are going to make it if we don't take an aggressive stance on attacking that uh, unlicensed market, especially for those who don't have any intention of getting licensed. Uh, so that's a, a huge priority for the Bureau to make sure we start making progress on that end, because the, the regulated market is not going to be successful if we can't protect them from the folks that are operating just across the way from them, and they're not paying those licensing fees or taxes or any of those things. So uh, 
if you if you're not signed if you if you never if you're new to the bureau uh, we send out also we have a list serve we also are active on social media we send a lot of information out and there's a lot of information available on our website we have fact sheets we have how to get licensed uh, we have all sorts of videos there's a lot of information out there uh, the best place to go is uh, bcc.ca.gov and you can uh, see all of that information. If people have questions, I think, you know, that's probably the toughest thing. So many of you probably have questions and we're happy to answer them. Uh, we have an email address that we have folks that that's all they do is answer questions. We want you to get good information. So we're available for licensees, for consumers, and we'll do our best to answer all your questions to make sure we get, and if we can't answer it, we're gonna get you to the right place. Um, I'm going to tell you, uh, al alcohol was very easy, uh, in retrospect, I never thought alcohol was easy to regulate until I started regulating cannabis. It is gets complicated sometimes, and I, I can only imagine as a consumer or even a licensee, it's like, wow, there's just a lot to know out there. And so we do our best to help you navigate this product. And really, uh, I'm, I'm just going to tell you, I, we, we feel like, you know, we, we want the state, we want the city to be successful, and really, we want the licensee to be successful. Really, this is, when we regulate this product, it's, it's, we want it to benefit everybody. And I think um, it's just important to know that public safety and consumer safety at the state and the local level is always our top priority. But I think if we all work together, uh, we're we're going to make progress, and I I I, I want to just congratulate all your retailers that I went to. Uh, I, honestly, you should be very proud. I, I'm I, I I'm so glad I made this trip, by the way. And you guys have been so welcoming. All of you have been very welcoming, and I thank you, Chief Salinas, for inviting me here tonight. So that is all I have. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you again, Lori. Uh, can everyone hear me back there? Good. Yeah, I think well, there's a lot of... So, uh, you know, we need to raise it higher. How's that? That's fine. So, uh, first, I'd like to thank everyone for coming. I don't know that I've ever had this many people come to hear me speak. Uh, I don't know if it's me or if it's a free food, but thank you regardless. Uh, the, the point of this presentation today is to keep our community informed as to what's happening with cannabis in the city of Fort Wayne. We've been doing this now for a complete year, and so we wanted to be as transparent as possible, uh, ranging everything from sales figures all the way to what's happening in terms of env environmental impacts, such as crime, traffic, and if it's impacting our schools. Uh, but before we get started, uh, I wanted to thank some of our sponsors. Uh, I wanted to thank uh, Skunk Masters, Wainini Patient Collective, uh, Wheelhouse, and From the Earth, who helped pay for some of this event this evening. Uh, part of our keeping our community informed was we had every single one of our seven licensed dispensaries come here today so that our community can meet the owners behind the scenes. That was very important to us. We want people to know that hey, they're not hiding somewhere, and they don't want that. They don't want to be a part of this community because, as you'll see in this presentation, they're very much a part of this community. So, okay. So let's get started. Uh, in terms of questions, the way this is going to work is I have about 45 minutes uh, to talk and then we can take your question and answer uh, questions afterwards. Uh, I have a panel that's coming up here to help answer any of your questions that you may have this evening. Uh, we have David Garcia, who's a cannabis consultant and expert in the field of cannabis, as well as one of our de uh, community development director, Tony Stewart. So how did we get here? Uh, for us, it started back in 1996 with the uh, Proposition 215, the Compassionate Use Act, and it has now come to a head here in 2019, as Lori explained, 
with the um, officially the Medical and Adult Use Cannabis Regulation and Safety Act of, um, that came along with Proposition 64, which became official with the regulations coming online on January 19th. So these are the regulations that all of our dispensaries must follow. And if any of you have read that document, it's about 150 pages long. So it is very complicated. So the city started into the cannabis industry back in July 5th of 2017 when they approved the city ordinance to allow uh, retail, non-storefront retail, cultivation, distribution, and delivery. Uh, they were in a financial situation which <coughs> led them to reaching out to these dispensary owners to hopefully create enough revenue to get us back on track. And based on what you're going to see here this evening, it's done that, if not more. So right now, one of the big issues that the state is contending with are licensing issues. Uh, as you can see, they have an exorbitant amount of temporary licenses right now, and very few permanent licenses that have been uh, allocated. Uh, we've been fortunate that we actually have two of our businesses here that have permanent licenses. So what's our goal here in Port Wainimi, and what is it that we're doing? So we've decided to actually take the leadership position in Ventura County, uh, ranging from the uh, regulatory work and keeping our community informed, not just the people that live here, but the entire county. Uh, we want to create a model program, and in doing so, uh, we scrutinize all of our licenses and application process, as well as receive public input in regards to our CUP, as well as taking the leadership role in creating law enforcement initiatives and not just relying on the BCC to regulate cannabis in our community. So I'll be discussing several of those law enforcement initiatives that we've done here in Port Wainimi. And as you'll see, we also want to create a model community contributions program. Many of our dispensaries here have committed to 1% of gross sales uh, donations to our community. And as you'll see, by some of the things that we have done, that they have, uh, they have donated quite a bit of money. So when you apply here in the city of Port Wainini, you have to go through this long application process. And we actually have a committee that reviews all of these licenses. Uh, it includes the city manager, myself, a consultant from HDL, Candy Miller, our community development director, Tony Stewart, our community development program manager, Yvonne Gonzalez, and Steve King, one of the city's consultants. Once we review all the applications and re approve them, uh, we then provide them to the city council for approval. So nothing gets approved without uh, the approval of the uh, city council. So this is the complex application process of all of our, all our dispensaries have to submit, and they have to actually address each one of these different uh, components. So there's 15, 14 different parts to this application, ranging from site control plans, security plans, uh, business acumen, uh, neighborhood compatibility, community benefits. We want to make sure that they're a fit for our community, and that's what this application process does. You can't just come in one day, pay for your business license, and then be given a spot, and then you're off and running. It's much more complicated than that. And the reason I bring this up is I want our community to know that these dispensaries go through a very extensive vetting process. So uh, they're experienced and they know exactly what they're doing. And they take this very, very seriously. Port Wainimi cannabis fees. It is not cheap to get into the cannabis industry, especially here in Port Wainimi. Not only are you responsible for paying state licensing fees, but you're also responsible for paying upfront fees here to the city of Port Wainimi upwards of $30,000 just to get started, uh, which includes a $10,000 application process, uh, deposit, ranging all the way to paying uh, upwards of $400 for every live scan you do here in the city of Port Wainimi. So this is just to get started, besides your state license and fees, and federal taxes and state taxes you're paying on top of uh, your retail sales, once you get started. The one thing I should point out as well is, I know it may be difficult to see some of these slides in the back. Uh, we tested this this morning and realized it's a pretty decent distance. So all of these slides will be available to anyone after the presentation. Provide me with your, you'll be able to email me. I'll give you my email address and I will email you this entire presentation. 
So where are we now? We have, we currently have seven dispensaries that have been licensed and approved in the city of Port Wyneme. Uh, the sixth one actually goes online tomorrow, with the seventh one, Tradecraft Farms, which is here today, which will probably be in operation in the next two to three months. Uh, Tradecraft Farms is unique in that they'll be the actual first micro business operating here in the city of Port Wyneme. And so this is where they are currently located in the city. Now here I, I represent what's called the Green Mile along the Channel Islands Corridor. Uh, and more perspective is the only dispensary at this time that has been approved but is actually in the south end of Port Wyneme located on Pleasant Valley Road. Uh, they, if you guys are familiar with the area, it's the old Pop Deck Bar. Um, and Emerald Perspective is now uh, located uh, there in the 100 block of Pleasant Valley Road. So, people wonder why we call this the Green Mile. Uh, quite frankly, if you were to draw a line, as I've done here, from Ventura Road <laughs> all the way to Wheelhouse, it is exactly 5,260 feet, which is a mile, and hence the term, the Green Mile, and that's where we get that from. So we'll be talking a great deal about this specific area during this presentation. So I'm going to blow this up in a second here, but it's just to give you an idea of where all of these potential cannabis businesses are going to be located along this Green Mile corridor, upwards of 13. Uh, one is not included, which is Emerald Perspective, because again, they're in the south end of the city. So this is where they all will potentially be located along this corridor, which will be nine recreational cannabis retailers, four cultivators, and three delivery. Now some of you are asking, that doesn't add up to... Uh, 13, but uh, micro business, which is going to be open in a couple months, I actually gave them one for cultivation and one for uh, recreational cannabis retailer, as they'll be doing both. like for those in the back row that can actually see it's the breakdown of each dis uh, dispensary name where they're located what they're permitted for going to be permitted for and what the status is of their application so right now you'll see that we have seven that have been uh, approved and a permit issued uh, with the remaining six in progress this is what it looks like in the entire city so if we were to take all the applications thus far that have been submitted uh, in the city of Port Wyneme, this is what it looks like on a map, with a majority down in the north end, along the Green Mile Corridor, and uh, a few down in the south end. These down here are in an industrial zone, so they'll only be allowed to either manufacture or cultivate. Okay, so throughout this presentation, I'm going to be presenting some myth busters. Uh, for instance, dispensaries are a hotbed for criminal activity. The answer to that is no, it is not. Uh, illegal dispensaries are a hotbed for criminal activity, and we don't have any illegal dispensaries here in the city of Port Wyneme. Uh, we only have our seven licensed dispensaries. We did have one pop up about a year ago, and uh, it didn't take us very long to find out, and uh, they were cited and arrested, and uh, they never came back, and since then we haven't had any additional illegal dispensaries pop up here in the city of Port Wyneme. So, when people think of cannabis dispensaries, this is what people commonly think of. These two locations here out on Venice Boardwalk, as well as this dispensary here in Las Vegas, this is what it looks like. That's not what it looks like here in the city of Port Wyneme. 
It looks like this. These are our, this is an example of what an exterior of one of our businesses looks like. That's an example of one of the interiors of our, of our kind of businesses looks like. Again, another exterior picture. And one more to show you. That's what an interior of one of our dispensaries looks like. It doesn't look like the seedy smoke shop that people may have a preconceived notion when it comes to these types of businesses. It is not they're very welcoming. They're open, they're bright, and they want to be um, somewhere where a customer wants to come back and return. So with that myth, it's actually busted. <laughs> So development agreements. The city decided not only to uh, it decided to enter into a contract with our dispensaries rather than just impose a local sales tax. And so what we did is we generated these development agreements and special uh, conditional use permits, which allowed us to add a number of criteria. So we weren't just relying on the BCC to regulate our dispensaries. We wanted to have that input and add our own recommendations to that. We've already touched on that very briefly as to what additional things that we're adding here in Portland Union. So I'm only going to talk to you very briefly about several of the security recommendations I've added onto that. Um, I actually have a list of 50 that they're all supposed to adhere to, and so I just want to hit on a few of those key uh, recommendations. For instance, none of them are allowed to have any type of social gatherings or after-hour gatherings with the exception of employee meetings, uh, inventory control, or some sort of presentation by the police department in terms of uh, sanction training. Uh, all their employees must wear uniforms and they must wear badges. Uh, the BCC says they must wear badges. We want them to wear uniforms because we want to be able to readily identify them on their live camera feeds and the security cameras that we have looking into these dispensaries. And should something exigent happen within these dispensaries, we want to be able to easily identify the employee from the customer. Additional ones uh, include um, all patients or customers in the business must take off all hats, hoodies, glasses, uh, any type of identification intrusion device, <coughs> excuse me, clothing, so that we can readily identify them on the video camera so we know exactly who it is that uh, they're servicing. Should something happen within the, the dispensary, we can easily identify each one of these individuals. And some people don't know, uh, here in the city of Port Wainimi, uh, we require that each dispensary have a cloud-based security system in which I can go on using my cell phone and with a matter of five seconds can actually see what's going on in each one of our dispensaries. Each one of my officers has a smartphone and can actually look inside of one of the dispensaries 24 hours a day to see what's happening there. To take that a step further, our dispatch center has a giant iPad in there. So if an alarm goes off after hours or an alarm is hit, the dispatcher can see exactly what's going on in that dispensary to warn our officers before they arrive. People talk about odors coming out of these dispensaries. So if an odor is emanating from the dispensary uh, at any time and we receive a complaint, they have less than 24 hours to remedy the situation. All right. And another example would be power outages. If there is a power outage and they lose power inside of their dispensary and their alarm systems and security systems go offline, they must immediately shut down and aren't allowed to go back online until their security systems uh, are working properly. And so everyone knows here as well, every employee, including owner, must be live scanned and have a complete background done by the respective police department. Uh, they get photographed and they aren't allowed to work until they get a letter signed by me along with their official badge identification that says they are now authorized to work inside of that dispensary. And this is what I talked about here in terms of what other occupation requires you to go through this type of background to work at that place of employment. You sure aren't getting this at McDonald's or any other location. So the people that are behind the counter are people that uh, have been vetted 
very thoroughly, not only by the dispensary hiring them, but, but by the police department. And I'll tell you what, uh, when they have to pay $400 every time someone comes in to uh, get live scan, that dispensary is doing a very good job of vetting their employees because after the first couple of times of just sending whomever inside uh, and having to pay that $400 to get an immediate rejection, uh, they quickly found out that they better have a pretty good interview process in place. So we've done over 150 live scans thus far in the one year that we've been uh, doing this at $400 each, uh, which is a revenue to the city of uh, $61,500 this far, which is paying for my civilian position in our records division. Uh, we talked about backgrounds. I'm going to quickly go over this. So as a police chief, I can disqualify potential applicants due to their criminal backgrounds, such as having violent or serious felony convictions, uh, convictions of moral turpitude, um, as well as I can take into consideration a number of other uh, items, such as the nature and severity of the offense, as well as their criminal history as a whole. So they may not have immediate disqualifiers, but if they've been arrested several times over the past year, that grants me the authority to disqualify the candidate. So I talked about mandatory identification cards that each one of these dispensaries must wear uh, and have issued to each one of their employees. These are the badges or identification cards that the police department issues. Uh, the reason why we issue the badge, badges as opposed to the dispensary, it prevents the dispensaries from illegally duplicating them. Um, because it would be very easy for them to say that employee works there and our department not know about it, as long as they were wearing a duplicated badge. In this case, uh, we issue them. They all come with specific numbers, uh, a first name and last name initial, and what their position is with that dispensary. And they are not allowed to be working in that dispensary unless they have that around their neck at all times. So myth buster number two. People have this preconceived notion is that that's what the employees look like inside of these dispensaries. You know, these pothead looking individuals with the long dreadlocks, and that could be any further from the case. So pictures that I just took yesterday, or the day before, this is what the employees look like. Um, they're clean cut individuals, uh, they, they have a background in cannabis, they know what they're talking about. Uh, they have uniforms on, as you can tell. Uh, they have their badges on. And um, again, these dispensaries are trying to sell a brand. They want people to come back. So they definitely vet their employees, so they are producing a high quality product. Um, and they're able to sell their brand, so they get that returning customer. When you have so many dispensaries in one area, you have to sell your product and get them to want to come back over and over again. And this is one way that they do it. And this one is busted. Thank you. So one of the requirements that the city had when they approved the applications for our local dispensaries is that they had to attempt to hire people from the city of Port Wayne. And so here's a breakdown of all the different uh, locations that our dispensary employees live at. Um, so I broke it down between Port Wayne, Oxnard, Ventura, Camarillo, and other. Here are our six dispensaries, uh, wheelhouses included, even though they open up tomorrow because they've already got all 16 of their employees live scanned. And so this is what it looks like if you highlight Port you highlight Port Wainimi. Uh, of the 114 employees, 20 of them come from the city of Port Wainimi, with a majority of the employees coming from the city of Oxnard. So thus far, our cannabis employees, uh, the cannabis businesses actually have created 114 jobs. So let's talk about why a lot of you are here. They want to hear how cannabis is doing in Fort Wayne. So our first business opened up late January, January 30th of last year. So we consider that February of 2018. Um, for a complete almost a year now, we've had four dispensaries online. Um, and through the calendar year 2018, those four dispensaries have generated uh, over $11 million and peaked in December of 2018 during the holiday season, bringing in 
million dollars, so two two million one hundred sixty thousand dollars for one month. That translates into eleven million dollars for all of 2018. So here we're going to show is that's what the revenue was when we had one dispensary online or two dispensaries. This is what it looked like when we had three dispensaries online, and then when the fourth came online, you can see how we went up. So what does this look like for 2018? 11.3 million dollars. 2019, we're forecasting 25 million dollars, and in 2020, 35 million dollars in gross annual revenue. Uh, what does that translate into 5% city revenue? That's half a million dollars thus far in 2018, 1.25 million dollars in 2019, and 1.75 million dollars uh, by 2020 for a cumulative total of three and a half million dollars for the first three years. And that's only taken into consideration the four dispensaries that are currently online. And we're going to have seven online here uh, total in the next couple of months. We don't know where that cap is right now in terms of where things are going to settle, but right now it's still on an upward trajectory. So these are very conservative numbers. People want to know how many customers per day are coming to these dispensaries. So this gives a breakdown of how many customers are coming per day and how many actually visit every month here in the city of Port Wainini. Because that invariably has some sort of traffic impact or environmental impact here. Right now, we are averaging 1,150 customers a day that come to the city of Port Wainini to purchase cannabis. That equates to 35,000 people that come into the city of Port Wainini each month to purchase cannabis and visit one of our four dispensaries, because these figures only account for four dispensaries. That's how it's broken down. It averages out to about $65 to, $65 to $75 per transaction, with the ages ranging between 21 years, obviously, all the way upwards of 90 years old, although there is one person on the books that is 95 years old that has come to purchase cannabis here at one point. Good interview. So where are the customers coming from? This is a breakdown of where all our customers are coming from in, into the city of Port Wainini. Only 10% of our customers actually live and reside in the city of Port Wainini, with 42% coming from the city of Oxnard. The way we're able to exist with so many dispensaries is they're not coming from Port Wainini, they're coming from the neighboring cities, which include Ventura, Camarillo, and Oxnard. The other that you see down there below are out-of-county people and people that are out-of-state. Um, 13% of our customers uh, come from out of state and uh, with 1.5% coming from Arizona and they're on down. This was particularly noticeable during uh, November and the December months, during the holiday seasons when people were coming to visit from out of state where cannabis was not allowed to sold. Here's a copy of our age demographics. Uh, how old are our customers? This was taking uh, figures from all four of our dispensaries, which pretty much are seeing very similar percentages. Uh, the biggest category is the age between 21 and 30 percent, it's 35 uh, percent. Ages 31 to 40 is 25 percent. And then you'd be surprised on 41 and over accounts for nearly 40 percent of customers into our cannabis dispensaries. I took this picture just the other day and I wanted to to note something, if you can see it, is this elderly woman here with her caretaker and her walker coming into one of our dispensaries there to get some medicinal cannabis. It is not strictly recreational. What are our cannabis businesses selling? The majority of what they're selling is flour. And here's a representation, a picture of each one of these, uh, followed by vape, free rolls, drinks, and edibles. Uh, so this is what's being sold by all of our dispensaries here in the city of Port Wainini. Mm -hmm. So I'll jump ahead there. But this gives a breakdown of the majority of the cities selling cannabis here in the state of California, and what their tax rates are, and where Port Wainini falls in that tax rate. We're actually very low as compared to some of the other cities, uh, such as Palm Springs and Long Beach. And why that takes why we should take note of that is the average person spending $100 is going to be spending 
somewhere in the area of ten to twelve dollars less here in the city of Port Wyneme than we are in some of these other cities, which makes Port Wyneme very attractive for a, a lot of these businesses here because the tax rates are definitely competitive and much lower than some of these other cities here. So one of the biggest complaints I got from our dispensaries that came online here in Port Wyneme is the illegal deliveries. And so we wanted to do something about that. And uh, as well as the state taxes that they were having to deal with. And so uh, you'll see later on in the presentation how the police department addressed that issue uh, by conducting several undercover operations to help deal with the illegal delivery services. But part of the last slide that I talk about here in those taxes is a lot of the dispensaries are having a hard time competing with the black market because the taxes are so high. So right now, uh, there's legislation to actually lower, temporarily lower the state tax rate from 15% to 11% for a small period of time to allow the legal cannabis industry to get uh, situated and established and, and hopefully to get them on their way and hopefully uh, flush out the black market. Community benefits. So one of our goals here was to create a model community benefit program. Uh, as we've uh, talked to a great deal of our dispensaries already about donating 1% of total growth sales to community organizations and nonprofits within the city of Fort Wayne. Uh, many of you uh, have recently seen an article uh, that came out actually uh, nationwide, actually worldwide, when the Port Wyneme dispensaries came together to purchase 100 beds for our West County Regional Homeless Shelter uh, by donating $25,000. Uh, this was the total amount of donations they made in 2018, which totaled $44,000. These are the different organizations that benefit from that, including our REACH program, our Explorer program, Real Guppies, our Historical Museum, the Carnegie Art Museum, Pops for Tops, our Boys and Girls Club, our Holiday Singer Luncheon, and uh, MyCop. These are all organizations that benefited from these donations in 2018. Now let's talk about 2019. Our dispensaries have already committed for this year over $137,000 um, with some of that already being contributed to the homeless shelter beds, which is $25,000 of that amount. A wheelhouse has already committed $50,000 to the community, and here are some of the other amounts that have already been uh, collected this year or have been committed uh, for this year. So that number is probably going to be closer to $200,000 donated by our respective cannabis dispensaries into our community. about the 5% gross revenue that the city uh, is seeing, this is kind of what is seen behind the scenes and a lot of people don't actually get to see. And so, uh, nearly $200,000 are hoping by the end of this year. Homeless shelter beds. Oh, I jumped ahead. And I left the flag. They've, uh, our Wyneme Lifeguard Program, they donate money, our Historical uh, Society Museum, Real Guppies. Our Drag Program this year got started off thanks to From the Earth, and our Holiday Senior Luncheon. These are just some of the few programs that they've donated to, uh, including Movies at the Park, Cops for Tots uh, was a big one this past year where we were able to serve nearly 1,000 children uh, that reside in South Oxnard and the city of Fort Wayne. So recently, thanks to our community donations, we, were, we saw a great deal of national media coverage. Uh, people were interested to see what our community contributions program was like, having just seen that our dispensaries donated $25,000 to buy 100 homeless shelter beds. So that made uh, every news outlet in Los Angeles, as far as all the way to the East Coast, it made US World News, as well as the cover of High Times. You know you've made the cover of High Times 
you've made it big. <laughs> so, I can retire now. <laughs> My job is done here. <laughs> Mythbuster number three, owners, owners may donate money to the community, but they are not a part of this community. And so I wanted to break that fallacy by showing you a couple of pictures. This is Trade Craft Farms at our homeless shelter. Putting bags together. This is Stone Masters at our Pots and Pots event. This is, I don't know respect you can't see them, but I was able to find the photo here. They're right there. They have the picture. They're there at our homeless shelter putting beds together. Safeport, the Jarvis family, Pops for Tots, there, donated money and volunteered their time. Again, they were the biggest contributor to the homeless shelter beds, and they contributed $25,000 of that $35,000. And as a side note, they decided to donate another $4,000 this week so that the homeless shelter could have um, cages and storage bins um, for the homeless. When I say cages, cages for their animals. Um, because a lot of homeless people will not go to a homeless shelter because they have no one to care for their animal. So now, thanks to uh, Skunk Masters, they've donated upwards of 10 uh, like dog corrals, uh, bike racks, um, disposable pillows, so the homeless person can come to the homeless shelter, have a nice fresh pillow, and if they decide not to return, they can actually take that pillow with them and have some comfort with them when they leave. And uh, right here is Wheelhouse, right, right here at our Cops for Cops event. Um, and again, that myth is busted. So let's talk about the economic impact here in the city of Port Wainimi. What has this done for us? Well, it's generated half a million dollars in 2018 in terms of cannabis tax. Um, $44,000 in community contributions and 114 jobs, which most of our dispensaries pay in the area of $15 to $20 an hour, which translates into $38,000 a year for a full-time employee working in these cannabis dispensaries. So that is the slide I created to show the economic impact that our dispensaries are having here in our community. So environmental concerns. So let's talk about traffic. With 1,150 customers coming into your city uh, every day, or 35,000 customers into the city of Port Wainimi uh, every month, has that impacted traffic? Has that increased your traffic collisions here? So I, I had to use this again because I just learned how to use it. <laughs> That's pretty cool. I think we're going to see that on a future city council presentation. <laughs> so, here's the breakdown. I wanted to compare previous years because I couldn't just show you how many traffic collisions that we've had in, in Port Wayne if we didn't have something to compare it to. And so we specifically went on the Twitters, which is a CHP state database which tracks all traffic collisions, so people would know that this stuff wasn't just made up. Anyone can retrieve this information. And so we specifically put in the Channel Islands corridor, the green mile between Ventura and Victoria Avenue. And so as you can see, uh, as compared to 2016, traffic collisions have actually reduced uh, along this specific corridor. So they have not increased as a result of the additional traffic into our city. Let's talk about crime. So I decided just to go on primemapping.com, just like anyone else here could, and pull this information down. This is just the last week in the city of Port Wainimi. But if you put up the green mile there, there's no crime. <laughs> and there's no reportable crime in that area, and I can attribute that to a few things. One, the security that they have, the armed guards, the video cameras, um, Nobody wants to be in that area. Nobody wants to lawyer and solicit in that area. And so um, that's what that's translated to. And that's just this last week. Let's see what it looks like 
uh, the last six months. Uh, the last six months, between September 19th and March 19th, the city has had four robberies during that six month period. None of them are in and around our dispensaries. So I decided to take it a step further and I pulled up all weapons violations in the area, which could include uh, somebody who is possessing a weapon or somebody who has actually committed an assault with a weapon. And that's what that picture looks like. Um, this is the Port Wainini border right here, and it ends across here. So I just wanted to kind of give you a complete picture adding the city of Oxford uh, as well along the right. And this is what it looks like for the entire year of 2018. These three knives that you see right here uh, on the map are occurring at the corner of Channel Islands and Ventura Road. Those are directly attributable to our transient population and the 99 cent store that we have located there. Um, they are not attributed to our local cannabis dispensaries. The two masks that you see here are robberies. One happened at the USA gas station at 11 o'clock at night, with this robbery occurring in the neighborhood um, off behind the dispensaries also at 11 o'clock at night. So over the past year, this is the complete year of 2018, uh, we've had no issues uh, with violent crime whatsoever in and around our dispensaries. And anyone can go online on crimemapping.com and pull up this information. Let's talk about school impacts. How has this affected our schools? In the city of Port Miami, we have four elementary schools. We also have Eo Green Junior High that is in the Oxnard jurisdiction that serves the population of Port Miami along with Miami High School. So you have the four smaller elementary schools here, the median school, which is the junior high, and the largest school here, which is Wainini High School. So I reached out to our superintendent, Christine Walker, to give me some insight as to what's happening in the schools. I also reached out to the SRO sergeant in Oxnard to give me some sort of uh, perspective as to what's been occurring in the schools over the last year. So this is verbatim. Overall, there has been no increase at the elementary schools, although we did just have our first incident, at least in the last five years, of possession at Hollywood Beach School, which is a school located way off over here in the distance. There have not been any incidents at the full elementary schools in Guaynini. So I decided to again reach out to our SRO sergeant, who told me that by far, vaping in the high school has been on the increase. Um, it is the largest increase that they've seen in quite some time, but that can't be solely attributed to Oxnard or Wainini or the dispensaries. It's actually a national trend that is occurring right now. Um, so the reason why these vaping wax pens are very popular in the junior highs, and this is verbatim from one of our junior high principals, is the following. We are seeing a drastic increase in vaping using the cartridges that hold the marijuana oil. Since they break into three pieces, the battery, the cartridge, and the charger, students will break them into pieces and farm them out so no one has the entire unit. They change hands each period, so it's extremely difficult and highly time-consuming to trace down the source. And so it's very easy, especially in the junior high level, for them to hide these. Uh, students report that the vape, they vape in the bathroom stalls and the TV locker rooms. They're also able to do so in class easily because they can have the vape in their sleeve uh, and inhale, then exhale the vape back into their shirt, shirt or hoodie where it dissipates without being seen or smelled. So that's what the junior highs are, are dealing with and some of the high schools are dealing with right now. And as I mentioned earlier, it is a nationwide, we'll call it epidemic um, right now that the high schools are facing in terms of vaping in the local high schools and it's not directly attributed just to our community. So I want to talk briefly about some of our law enforcement initiatives and some of the things that we're doing here. As I mentioned earlier, um, as soon as our dispensaries became online, one of the biggest complaints was the illegal delivery services operating in Oxnard as well as Port Miami. So what I did is, uh, thanks to some information I received from one of our local dispensaries, I went on weed, uh, weed maps and Leafly and obtained a list of every single business that was operating in our two cities and I sent them a letter to cease and desist. I then warned them that we were going to be conducting an undercover operation in our city and that they would be arrested and all their product would be seized. So I followed up on that promise. Let's go back. 
actually followed up on that promise. And in July of 2018, uh, our narcotics task force went out and attempted to make seven buys. And we were able to have five deliveries made to the city of Fort Wainimi, where these people were immediately contacted, identified, and cited, and all their products seen for operating an illegal delivery service within our city limits. So in terms of county-wide enforcement, in terms of illegal cultivation, uh, this was an illegal grow uh, in Oxnard. I believe it was in Oxnard. Uh, that our major crimes unit uh, that works, which is a county-wide task force that operates in the county, uh, took down over 3,200 plants in an indoor cultivation grow. Uh, they also seized uh, two shotguns, six handguns, and nine high-capacity magazines. And this is a picture of what that looked like here. And so we are actively out there looking for illegal dispensaries as well as cultivation growth and obviously delivery services. So I talked earlier about security and how we took it a level above what the BCC required and that's me being able to access their security systems at any time along with all of my officers in our dispatch center. And that's what, that's what that looks like right now. From that's what it would look like right now from your smartphone. Um, that's what this is a screen capture from my smartphone yesterday, and this is what our dispatcher sees in the dispatch center. And she can bring it up at any time if an alarm goes off and see what's happening within any one of our dispensaries. And again, it allows us to actually regulate from behind our desk and making sure that they are actually staying in compliance with our rules and regulations without actually having to go out there. We provide dispensary training to all of our dispensaries, free of charge. This is Sergeant Starna giving HPC um, some training before the start of their business day. And he gives training on how to detect false identification, uh, how to deal with impaired customers, as well as what to do during critical incidents should you be robbed or something happened within your dispensary and how to report that information as quickly as possible. These are sections, penal code sections, that we ask all of our dispensaries to make their customers aware of, uh, whether it be on the receipt, some sort of pamphlet and publication, on their website, posted within their dispensary, because we want all of our customers to know that these are the laws specifically addressing cannabis usage, especially within our city limits. And as a result, um, I have not seen an increase in reported marijuana use along our beaches or parks. doing to address any local issues here in the city of Fort Wayne. We've again decided to take a proactive approach instead of a reactive approach. So these are some of the things that we do on a consistent basis to make sure that we're staying on top of our cannabis dispensaries. We meet with them at least twice a year. We met with them in September and we just met with them again today uh, before this meeting. We want to keep the line of communication open so that we can help each other out and uh, we make sure that they understand what's required of us. Um, we just recently implemented our, updated our social post ordinance, which only included illegal narcotic drugs as well as alcohol, and now that ordinance now includes cannabis. We, we require mandatory literature in all of our retail stores. This is an example of what that literature looks like. Uh, we, we worked on some literature with the Office of Traffic Safety as well as the Detroit County Behavioral Health. And we came up with this version in English and in Spanish. And each one of our dispensaries is required to have this uh, readily available for all of their customers. There are no automatically automatic renewal of permits here in the city of Fort Wyoming. Every year, uh, each dispensary goes uh, through an audit and inspection that they pay for. Uh, we restrict hours of operation. Uh, they are only allowed to be open from 9 to 9 every day, and we check that on our cameras every day. 
Minor decoy operations. I didn't actually talk about that when I was at a slide, but over the past month, uh, we've done several minor decoy operations in our dispensaries. On January 4th, I sent each one of our dispensaries a letter warning them that I would be conducting a minor decoy operation over the next six months to make sure that they were not selling uh, to minors or were they allowing them into their dispensary. And so two weeks ago, I sent in a minor into every single dispensary that was open and nobody sold to a minor. They didn't get past the actual, either the security guard or the receptionist. And so they are not allowing minors into their dispensaries. I also wanted to test their software systems to make sure that they weren't selling in excess of the daily limit, which is one ounce of cannabis uh, each day. Uh, they were a little challenged by that because I did throw a curveball. I had the officer go in in the morning, buy a three quarters of an ounce, and then come back about six o'clock at night and buy another half ounce. I wanted to make sure that their software system was catching them. That individual had now purchased more than one ounce in one day. And four of our five dispensaries, well, I'd say three of our five dispensaries uh, did not pass. One just had a math problem and couldn't add the grams that they did not actually technically sell beyond the, the one ounce. And so um, that's something that I put into play and I want it fixed. And so while we didn't issue violations for that, we just want the problem fixed and we want to know that they are adhering to all of uh, the BCC regulations. Uh, I talked about training. We provide training to all of our dispensaries. Uh, they give us a call and we're talking to all of their employees and making sure that um, they have a fully trained staff when operating here in the city of Copacabana, which goes along to everybody here has probably heard of this RBS, which is Responsible Beverage uh, Training or Responsible Beverage Service. Uh, that's a two-hour requirement that the city of Oxnard has of all alcohol uh, distributors or employees that are actually vending alcohol. So we wanted to start a very similar program here in the city of Fort Wayne, uh, which is Responsible Cannabis uh, Service Training Program, which requires every employee to go through a two-hour training program with the Fort Wayne Police Department to make sure that they are adhering and are well-versed on the rules and regulations here in the city of Fort Wayne, as well as giving them some additional training with additional experts. To give you an example, these cannabis consultants are dispensing a Schedule One federal drug that they have no formalized training. And so we want to make sure that they get as much training as possible uh, when it comes to dispensing uh, cannabis. So one of the big concerns here in the city of Fort Wayne is over concentration, over saturation. Um, the, BC, the BCC actually uh, talks about this in the regulations. So here's a blown up map of what all the eventually permitted dispensaries in Hawaii will look like if they are approved and what that saturation actually looks like, uh, which can be very concerning. And so there is an actual ECC regulation that deals with excessive concentration. And the reason why these licenses are still being approved is because Hawaii is the only show in town right now. The BCC takes into account the census tract for, with the entire, taking into consideration the entire population of the county in terms of, of, of approving uh, licenses in the county. For this reason, uh, we're able to have this many dispensaries in the city of Hawaii. One of the reasons also that they're concentrated in this one area is because our zoning, we can only have retail businesses in specific locations, so they're all along that specific stretch, which we've known as, which we've come to know as Green Mile. So there will become a point where the state decides, you know what, we have too many dispensaries in your city or too many dispensaries along this stretch of roadway, and we'll stop approving licenses, whether the city of Port Wyoming does it or not. So that brings us to the conclusion of my presentation. Uh, if anybody wants a copy of this presentation, all you have to do is email me at asalinas at cityofportwinemi.org. You can find us at any one of these social platforms. Uh, there's my number, that's my direct desk line, um, and we'll get you a copy of that presentation. What I'd like to do now before I get any further questions from the audience is have 
Tony Stewart and David Garcia come on up here so they can help me answer any of the questions you may have. And in doing so, what I'd like to actually is read uh, quickly about these two individuals. Uh, David Garcia, who's coming up, is co-owner of the Roots Dispensary and president of DA Management Group and has over a decade of knowledge and experience in the cannabis industry. He is a cannabis specialist that can identify any type of strain, the origin, the origin, how it's cultivated, cured, processed, and its benefits. Mr. Garcia was actually born in Ventura County and was a graduate of Wyoming High School. Uh, he took it upon himself to research the healing benefits of cannabis as an alternative to pharmaceuticals um, based on an injury that he received playing baseball. Uh, our other individual that we have coming up here is Tony Stewart. Uh, he's our city's community development director and has been with the city since April of 2017. Mr. Stewart has over 30 years of experience working in the planning and community development fields. He began his professional career as an environmental planner and urban designer for a private private planning firm in Palm Springs and has since worked his way up the ladder in the planning field for several Southern California cities, including Rancho Mirage, Artesia, and Simi Valley. Tony possesses a bachelor's and master's degree in urban planning from Cal Poly Pomona and is certified by the American Institute of Certified Planners. As Port Wyoming's Community Development Director and City Planner, Mr. Stewart oversees all of the city's cannabis business applications. So we have a table that's supposed to come up here, but what we'll do is we'll just we'll just stand up here and if anyone has any questions in terms of cannabis, we'd be more than happy to answer them. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, I was wondering uh, if the money that has been allocated, has, what has been allocated to your department for the training of officers to protect the cannabis DUI and equipment purchasing for uh, monitoring that? That's a very good question. So I came before the city council in December of 2017, and I requested a couple of officers and a civilian to address the cannabis businesses, businesses that were going to be growing in our city beginning in 2018. Uh, they did approve the civilian position to help process the application, but they wanted to have money in their pocket first before spending any additional money. So I do have a commitment from the city manager as well as the city council that now that we're starting to see some of that revenue come into the city, we're going to start adding additional officers. So we should be seeing uh, two to three positions uh, over the next 18 months that will be added to our sworn police force as a result of cannabis. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Well, uh, you that is question. just like I can't hear the question back here. So she wanted to, she wanted me to address uh, cannabis in the junior highs and how we were going to help limit uh, the access to youth, uh, especially at the junior high and high school level. Um, my answer to that is just like alcohol, it's a parent's responsibility to teach their children and help restrict access to this, especially since it's, most of it's occurring within the household. Uh, it's very difficult for the police department to uh, enforce issues within a residence, and that's why we're doing as much as we can to uh, bring awareness and education to our community as well as the customers there in terms of access to our youth, and actually working with other agencies such as Ventura County Behavioral Health to help address these issues. For clarification purposes, did the principal state if it was cannabis, tobacco, or any other big substance? She did indicate that there was an increase in the use of marijuana or cannabis wax specifically. And vaping. But, and vaping, yes, absolutely. Uh, but it wasn't necessarily marijuana vaping. Vaping in general is off the charts um, the, um, dramatic, on the dramatic increase. 
um, but that some of that is in fact uh, marijuana wax or cannabis wax. Yes, sir. Is there a process in place that can keep any person from going from dispensary to dispensary to dispensary to dispensary and get an ounce in each one? That's a very good question. And the answer to that is no. Um, because these dispensaries don't work on a integrated system in terms of sales just yet, um, there is no way for the state or the police department to track that. And so you're right, with seven dispensaries in the city of Fort Wyoming, technically someone can go and purchase one ounce from every single dispensary. Uh, why someone would purchase that much, I don't know, because to resell it is really cost prohibitive um, in terms of buying that much and then trying to resell it yourself. Uh, but to answer your question is, there is not. Um, can someone answer that? I, I believe that the, city, the state will eventually get to that point where like their tra uh, track and trace system, everybody's on the same system and accountable for their inventory, and thus will be accountable for the amount of uh, cannabis they're dispensing every day. Um, and being able to actually bring all these countries together on one system. Yes, sir. Uh, does the city of Fort Wyoming have any plans to enact a social equity program or a cannabis equity program like they've had in Oakland or Long Beach to help support uh, minority cannabis business owners? Yeah, so that'd be okay. Uh, okay. Okay. Okay, at this point, uh, we don't have that right now. Um, like like uh, Chief said earlier, though, we do encourage uh, all of our dispensaries and all of our campus business owners to at least be hiring local. Uh, but no, we are not specifically looking at uh, minorities, uh, per se. Um, although we do have, uh, for instance, uh, minority-owned, women-owned uh, businesses here in, in town already in business. So, um, and again, you know, we work with those who come in uh, as best as we can. Do you have a recommended avenue for suggesting that or bringing it up at the city level? Well, at this point, um, one of the uh, the things we have here, and what she had uh, pointed out yet, is that we're pretty much getting to the the maximum limit of the businesses that will be able to be accommodated here in the city. Um, so at this point, we're pretty late in that process, uh, so it has not been discussed yet. Um, but it's something that, you know, again, if it, it is something that we could look at, I'm, I'm sure, um, if we do find we are at that point in, you know, in work. Yes, ma'am. Uh, getting back to the issue of the increase in vaping in the schools, how, how is the school district responding to that? How are they addressing that with those that, the kids who are doing that? And are the police, are you involved with that process? That's a good question. And so I do know that our superintendent of schools here is working with her principals to uh, provide them with more training and using the resources they have uh, in the city of Oxford with the school resource program and the school resource officers to come and provide training to their teachers as this is becoming uh, more prevalent in all of the schools, especially in junior high and high school. Is that correct? Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, I haven't noticed, and I used to drive to part uh, Culver City and Los Angeles, etc. All the green crosses has are do our signage ordinances specifically prohibit the green cross because it's nice not seeing them. <laughs> I'll answer that. No, uh, we don't specifically, but at the same time, when they're going through the process, we do try to discourage um, blatant advertising, so to speak. And we're finding on all of our dispensaries so far, they, they've pretty much kept up with that. Um, the you know, Constitution doesn't allow us to actually regulate when it's put on a sign, uh, but again, we do try to work with our business owners. Uh, we do have sign programs in place for some of these shopping centers that also help us also regulate uh, against that type of signage. Yes, sir. Yeah, will the uh, video surveillance tapes that are available to the Fort Wayne Indian Arts and Arts Police Department also be available to the public at large? Mm -hmm. 
No. So I don't think that, that video falls under the Public Records uh, Information Act uh, in terms of making it available to the public. Uh, you would be the first to ask. I'd have to take a look into that. But because it's a private business and they're private operations, I'm pretty confident that it is not available to the public. Yes, ma'am. Have you noticed any uh, statistics on the increase in maybe revenue from the local businesses, restaurants, retailers, based on the influx of traffic in the neighborhood? I knew I was going to get that question. So I reached out to HDL, which is the company that we uh, pay to deal with our city sales tax and revenue. And I wanted to know specifically, in 2018, did other revenue in the local businesses along that corridor increase? Uh, and I was not able to get that information. I know Steve tried to help me get that information. But anecdotally, uh, it is my belief that it has. Uh, and I think a lot of the business owners in the area uh, will, will share that same sentiment especially the food industry. Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. Yes, ma'am. So on one of your previous slides, you indicated that uh, no smoking within a thousand feet of a school or a youth center. Just found out that my house is 521 feet. Do I need to move? <laughs> From the dispensary? No, my house is from Barn Elementary. Oh, no, as long as you're doing it within your private residence, you're fine. The <laughs> same with cannabis usage. Anyone can smoke cannabis in the privacy of their own place. Yes, sir. Um, uh, going off that, uh, you had any issues with uh, landlords as to uh, them allowing cannabis consumption in those private homes for rent? Oh, so you're asking if landlords such as B and B's or people that rent their homes. Have we had issues with people smoking cannabis within those residences? Well, like where, like where, like, uh, rentals or apartments that people live in that they rent, but it is legal to consume cannabis. But Correct. The landlord said, so just like smoking, I would assume that there's some sort of advanced deposit that you're going to end up forfeiting if the landlord comes back, takes possession of his unit, and it smells like cannabis. Uh, but in terms of the landlord attempting to regulate it within his uh, residency, I'm assuming that would have to be a contractual uh, understanding between both parties, um, and it would work just like it does with cigarettes. Yes, ma'am. Um, I'd like to talk about that. I actually work for a company, a apartment complex, and we have a lot of excellent people out there that are Can't hear the question. Can't hear the question. What? She wants to know if we've seen an increase in uh, driving impairment as it relates to cannabis, or I think it's called DUI, uh, and we have not. Uh, while well, a majority of my, my officers are trained to uh, detect driving under the influence of marijuana, we have not specifically seen an increase in DUI-related uh, driving as it relates to marijuana in the city of Fort Wayne. But I will say this is only 10% of our customers come from Fort Wayne. So they're driving out to other cities. And so I would have to defer that question to the other cities if they've seen an increase in cannabis-related driving. I did reach out to St. John's Hospital, the director of nursing, and asked her if they have statistics in regards to cannabis-related incidents, overdoses, uh, medical visits, and they do not track uh, cannabis specifically. So she was not able to provide them that information. Yes, ma'am. I love that everybody's here. I want to say that right away. I have to discourse that out. But I have a question. Uh, the numbers that you projected up here shows that our little tiny community is almost a destination 
uh, for the landlocked marijuana user or cannabis user. Uh, and uh, my question is, would Vienna, would Vienna like to expect maybe somewhere down the line have a festival or a uh, weekend like we do with Banana Festival or the... <laughs> So I'll let Tony, our, our Development Director, answer that question. Well, we've had um, several inquiries at this point, but no actual application submitted yet. Um, but one is being put together, as I understand right now, for the Ocean View Pavilion uh, right down in Black Beach. And they're looking at probably uh, starting slow with one weekend event, maybe um, gradually, eventually having them, say, once a quarter or something like that depending on how, how well the first one goes. So that should probably happen, we're thinking, June, July, um, sometime in the summer. Um, and then you know, we'll see if we have events, say, down at the beach or whatnot. Uh, if we do, uh, actually, all of our events at the beach, whether the campus or not, have to go uh, to the city council for approval first uh, for our local coastal plan. Uh, so you folks uh, will probably lo know about that. Um, but we do also have, um, a, um, I guess we'll call it a uh, um, street fair coming up this uh, Saturday uh, at, uh, in conjunction with one of our new uh, dispensaries that's just coming online tomorrow. Um, and that will be at Wheelhouse and Channel Islands at 521 uh, Channel Islands Boulevard. So um, you can go ahead and talk to our Wheelhouse folks about that particular event if you're interested in that one. Um, and also come and see what one of those is like uh, once we have that. A little bit smaller than our beach festivals, but uh, again, that will be our first phase, and we do uh, envision having additional festivals uh, as the application is done. Yes, sir. You mentioned having growing operations eventually. Uh, I know Carpinteria is having some real difficulties with that, uh, the smell. Have you, how will you mitigate that issue here? We uh, here in the city for Wyoming only allow indoor grows, especially large indoor grows. Um, I have personally visited several indoor grows in the city of Los Angeles, city of Vernon, and I can tell you with certainty that you will not know that that building is there and growing cannabis within its walls. Um, the filtration and scrubbing systems that they have within their facilities, as long as they fall in line with uh, our conditions, and you won't even know that building is there. Uh, the problem that you find in Carpinteria is those are outdoor green houses and outdoor roads. And so when you're driving now on the 101 freeway, there's that section now that you smell cannabis nearly every time on the 101 freeway. We do allow personal grows within your residence, um, but in terms of outdoor personal grows, the restrictions are, are so great that there's really not a plot of land in Miami that would actually meet those standards. Well, we don't allow outdoor grow, period. There you go. Um, so it has to be indoor grow. And I doubt that we'd see one anywhere near the size of what the greenhouse would accommodate. I also want to add in one thing about those personal grows. Um, that is, we do have an ordinance, and it really isn't just anybody that can have one. It's in, only in certain areas where we have setbacks, and, and, you know, lots large enough to have that, and folks still have to come in and at least get a permit from the planning division. Uh, so it's not just somebody who can go out there and set up a grow in their heart development because it's right. not allowed for culture. So it also kind of answers that earlier question too with regard to rentals. Um, that basically you have to have a single family residence in a certain area in the city uh, to have that uh, personal growth. Uh, I want to hear from Mr. Garcia on who came in with the idea of having For states that have legalized cannabis, Hold it up. show that opioids have actually dropped. Consumption of pharmaceuticals actually dropped. Also, the sales of alcohol dropped as well. So we're starting to see, we're starting to see that. Is there any organized pain um, management group with a doctor involved that could really start to see how current the opiates? 
Not that I'm aware of. Yes, sir. Jim. Or Kate. Yes. sign ordinance in place, the sign ordinance regulates the size of the sign based on building uh, put in frontage, a uh, business frontage and whatnot. Um, and due to the size of the uh, particular business, uh, the dispensary in there, uh, they did actually meet the sign criteria. I took a very close look at that to make sure that we were able to uh, accommodate what they were asking for. In fact, um, one of the earlier iterations that came through uh, for one of the dispensaries there was actually too large, so it was not allowed to uh, uh, erect it. So what you see there does meet the city's current sign standards. Uh, with regard to the stump, Stumpmaster's uh, little truck out there, um, that also is allowed because, again, our sign ordinance does allow vehicles that are connected to a business at the location be parked there, similar to say Pizza and Dan's truck. Um, that again would be a similar type of situation where we do allow that vehicle uh, to be parked there, again based on our side. Well, we don't regulate the lights, you know, how the lights are as long as they're not shining off lights. That I can't answer you. I, I would say that that would probably be the property owner. Yes, sir. Uh, with uh, the increase in people coming to full I mean, for marijuana, has there been any noticeable increase in sales tax revenue for uh, restaurants or any of the other businesses around? Yes, yeah, so um, I believe we had a similar question to that earlier. That we did reach out to HDL, uh, the contractor that helps us deal with our sales tax revenue and um, they were not able to provide us with a specific response to that question in terms of have the businesses located in or around our dispensaries uh, seen an increase in business. But I do feel getting our statistics for 2018 into 2019, we'll be able to figure that information out. We just don't have it available now. Yes, sir. So, uh, I'm going to for that amazing presentation. I represent the 50,000 uh, registered Democrats here in the greater Oxnard area, mm -hmm. including the 4,737 registered Democrats right here in Fort Wayne, as president elect of the greater Oxnard organization Democrats. So, one of the platforms that our organization represents as representing those uh, voters is uh, responsible economic and business development. We really want a thriving economy and be friends with the chambers. Uh, so, I'm really wondering. Uh, and this is a personal side as a, as a resident of Fort Wayne. A lot of what is happening there, I think it's preventive as far as regulation. But I, as a resident speaking, I would say it's almost shocking regulation. So how do you plan um, to remain, uh, or and the city manager can speak to this too, how do we keep the city competitive 
when others enter the market, right? So right now we're challenging the market, uh, where system change uh, within the local economy, but we're going to be receiving competitive uh, areas even outside of the jurisdiction of my organization. So how do we uh, continue to grow the industry uh, while not furthering you know, the shock and the regulation? Uh, sure. So one of the things I would just add to that, for example, the camera, a uh, number of our members have brought to our attention, uh, is there any other business that we do that to, including health clinics, uh, pharmacies, uh, liquor stores, and then how do we mean pri uh, keep privacy for those uh, individuals, including city employees and police officers that are like to So, to answer that last question, is there is no other business that the city requires uh, access to their security cameras inside of their respective businesses? Uh, in terms of tracking our businesses and keeping us competitive here in Fort Wayne, uh, I think each one of these owners will testify that I've kept an open line of communication with them. And in fact, most of them will tell you is they, I know this sounds silly, but enjoy being regulated by the Chief of Police and the City of Fort Wayne and actually enjoy um, how we're doing business here. Um, in fact, there's a couple of them that just the other day gave me that exact answer. We appreciate Wyoming because you are, you don't mind being regulated, but you guys are being consistent and fair as compared to some of the other larger cities, such as Los Angeles. Um, does anyone over there want to comment on that? Okay. Sure, it's, it's a challenge in LA because again, we have a lot of people shops, a lot of different markets. Most of the business owners here are, are savvy to the market. We're also planning to provide the best level of service, the best products, the best branding, and really for a good customer base. So no matter what city pops up, we're still going to be in the of our business. Yes, we may not be at this level, but again, I'm telling you, so many ex fellow constituents, uh, members of, uh, living in the city, so bottom line, there will be enough locations, hopefully within the Ventura County, for people to get their safe access to the next so we could have two more questions, because uh, I promised to get out of here within a couple of hours. Yes, ma'am. Um, if I understand correctly, you get that fee from these uh, businesses to you on your smartphone as long as they have power. If the power drops, you're not getting that fee again. Is that correct? Correct. If the power goes out, I'm going to Are you going to be putting in a requirement that they have some backup power? For instance, I go to the bank. It doesn't matter if the bank's over or not. They don't run that security. There's a backup redundant camera is what I'm talking about. So there is not a requirement in terms of having backup cameras or, or backup batteries, but there is a requirement that means that they have to immediately shut down and cannot be in operation until those cameras are back online. And the way I can confirm that that's happening is I can easily send an officer down there to make sure that they've vacated the premises of all their employees and uh, customers until that power and security system is back online. Unfortunately, we haven't had that happen quite yet. Um, but they are well versed as that's one of my conditions. Okay, and my second comment was when you said that the flyer that they give out to people, I couldn't read it back here, but I'm just wanting to make sure. Are you also noting on there that they are not allowed to bring smoke? They will have problems if they take the uh, cannabis onto a federal facility. And yeah, we can stand here, sit here and say it's space, but there's a lot of other federal facilities that aren't so quite well known, like the airports, our airport, where you can get control. You understand what I'm going for because it's still a schedule one for us. Yes. Is that being noticed to the people who come in to purchase it? So, no, I don't require that type of literature, that type of information uh, being presented to their customers uh, as a matter of general information. Um, I would expect the person that's purchasing the cannabis to have some sort of uh, self-responsibility in making sure that they are aware of the laws as they relate to cannabis as terms of its use, and driving, as well as using you know, local airports or being on federal property. Yes, sir. This is actually a question for the dispensary. Uh, I have a lot of grandparents, I have a lot of relatives, uh, baby boomers, silent generation, still around school kitchen, and 
and they have a lot of questions about, well, cannabis in general. There's a lot of misinformation out there. There's a lot of questions they have about the medicine, about pain relief, about how it's grown. How are you all going to help serve a community that has a significantly high amount of senior citizens to encourage them to learn more and to come seek you out for the information that they're looking for? I think HPC Beth can answer that question because she's done that very thing uh, in one of our senior communities here in Colorado. Right here. Exactly. So what we do is we offer education. Um, and Erica, our manager, came in and spoke to about